weeks ago. It was about a brand new Air Force. It was an AC-130J ghost ship. And most of you are like, I have no idea what that is. But Emma, we can actually put a picture of what one of these. Uh, that is an AC-130J ghost rider. Um, that airplane was practically brand new. And back in April of 2005, uh, there was a pilot who was training, and the pilot who was training took the AC-130 out over the Gulf of Mexico. And what he was practicing, he was practicing something called a side slip. So he was, and I'm not entirely sure what it means, I'll try to explain it to you, but it, it, it doesn't really matter what it is. But what you do is you basically tilt the plane, apply opposite rudder, and it allows you to lose altitude quickly. But what happened was the pilot over side slipped and inverted the airplane. So he flipped the airplane, turned it upside down. And so he was able to recover the plane, turned it upside down, lost about 5,000 feet of altitude, landed the plane safely. But the catch is the plane is no longer airworthy. Because what the pilot did, he over G'd the airplane, meaning he put too much stress on the airplane by flipping it, and the Air Force had to take a $115 million loss. Because that's how much the airplane, it was brand new, $115 million loss. Now I know there's people in this room, you sold a house for a loss, a car for a loss, some stock for a loss, a business for a loss. Hopefully you haven't lost $115 million on something. That's what happened to the United States Air Force because this pilot accidentally inverted the plane. Now, the thing that's interesting about that plane is it looks the same. It looks like if you park that AC-130 next to another AC-130 that is practically brand new, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They look almost identical. But here's the deal. One of them can withstand the pressure of flight. The other one can't. The one that wasn't over G can handle the pressure of flight. The other one cannot. It's not airworthy. It would crash if they flew it too long. And I'd be like, okay, what does that have to do with 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Well, here's the deal. There are people that I've had conversations with, and maybe you've had conversations, and maybe you're in this room and you feel this way, and I'm glad that you're here. I'm not trying to alienate, ostracize, or make fun of you. But there are people who would claim to be Christians but don't actually believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They would say, well, I'm a Christian, but I just don't think that Jesus bodily, really, historically rose from the grave. And while you take a Christian who does believe in the resurrection and somebody who doesn't believe in the resurrection and claims to be a Christian, and you put them side by side, maybe just like those airplanes, they look identical. Same behavior, same dress, same language, same knowledge, but here's the problem. The Christian who doesn't believe in the resurrection can't withstand the pressure that this life holds. Just like that AC-130 that's been over G can't handle the pressure, even though they look identical, if you don't believe in the resurrection, we're going to see that you cannot withhold and withstand the pressures that this life brings to you. Because something, I wouldn't make this bold of a statement if it wasn't in Scripture, but something that is absolutely key to becoming a biblical Christian, like a Christian according to the Bible, is to believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. That, that's a requirement. Now, there's closed-handed issues and open-handed issues within Christianity. Open-handed issues might be, you know, how we handle alcohol or how we handle music or how we do worship and stuff like that. Those are things that we can sometimes agree to disagree on, and we can still be brothers and sisters in Christ. But a closed-handed issue, according to the Scriptures, is the fact that Jesus literally, historically, 2,000 years ago, really, for three days was dead and then came back to life. Some of you are like, okay, Jason, back up your bold statement. Well, let me do that. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Paul writes this. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and look, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In other words, you will be rescued, you become a Christian. What's a prerequisite for becoming a Christian? That you believe that Jesus really, literally, was raised from the dead. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're, we're, in the, we're, we're working our way towards Easter. Easter is March 27th. That's what, two Sundays away from today? That's real. We've got one Sunday in between. So what we want to do is we want to focus on the resurrection and see why the resurrection is so important to Christianity. And what we're going to do is we're going to allow Paul to make a logical argument as to why Christianity needs the resurrection, why we need the resurrection. And I love this. 
Because if you talk with somebody who isn't a Christian, and I mean, I think it's great to have these conversations, and if you hold a view that's opposite of mine, like I said, I'm not trying to make fun of you, I'm not trying to ostracize you, but I just want to have a dialogue about it. And if you have a dialogue with people who don't believe in the resurrection, they look at Christians like we have to check our intellect at the door. And I'm like, oh yeah, you silly Christians, you believe that Jesus really rose from the grave, you're so naive, you're so weak, you need that, right? But I love what Paul does, because Paul is going to show us that we don't need to check our intellect at the door to be Christians. I saw the movie Star Wars. Who else saw the movie Star Wars? came out back in December. I saw it twice. I haven't seen a movie in theaters twice in like five years. That, that's how much I love that movie. And in order to enjoy Star Wars, Chase, correct me if I'm wrong, you have to engage in what? Suspension of belief? Is that what it is? Yeah. Suspension of disbelief. Disbelief. Well, I, I got that wrong. I'm glad to told you to correct me. Suspension of disbelief. And what that means is that in order to enjoy Star Wars, you can't sit there and critique it and go, well, that could never happen. You know, like, if that's the way you thought about Star Wars, when those opening rolling words start out, you go, a galaxy long, a far, far away, you're just like, long, long time ago, it's like, okay, I can't enjoy this movie. And what that shows us that is that in order to enjoy Things like Star Wars and fictional movies like that, we have to have suspension of disbelief, right? Yes. Okay, suspension of disbelief. And some people would think you've got to do that with Christianity. Oh, to come into the church house and to worship and to do all the things that you guys do, when you walk through the doors, you've got to have suspension of disbelief. But what Paul's going to show us here, he's going to show us, you don't have to do that. In fact, I would make the argument that the burden of proof isn't just on the believer to prove that Jesus resurrected from the grave. I'd make the argument that the burden of proof is on the unbeliever to prove that he didn't. Because you've got to look at history. 2,000 years ago, something happened. Something happened because the church, as we know it today, practically came out of nowhere and exploded onto the scene. And in a little under 300 years, without Facebook, Twitter, social media, text messaging, and cell phones, it spread throughout half of the known world. Why? People were willing to die for it. People gave their lives for it. The disciples, who were basically a gaggle of cowards, all of a sudden got really bold and died for Jesus. You've got to explain that away. And so if Jesus really didn't resurrect from the grave, where did Christianity come from? Why did a bunch of first century, first century Jewish people who would have never believed in a resurrection all of a sudden believe in a resurrected guy? Why did the church explode onto the scene and guys who were cowards be willing to give their life for Jesus? And the point is simply this. It actually sounds more illogical to say that he didn't resurrect from the grave, I believe, than it does to say he did. So we're dealing with this. We're wrestling through this. We're having conversations about this. And we're going to see Paul go and show us why it actually matters. Because I don't want any of us in this room to be like, well, you know, maybe Jesus rose from the grave. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. And it probably really doesn't matter. No, it really does matter. And Paul's going to show us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 22. So with that being said, let's get started. Our first point is this, denial of the resurrection. Denial of the resurrection. Now, before we start reading, we've got to understand our context because Paul is writing a letter to a church. And I love this because Paul's going to show us that he's a pastor. He, he cares about people and he's engaging in ministry. How do we know that? Paul knows that they're struggling with an issue and he addresses it. That's what he's about to do. So that's kind of a big picture for our first point. Paul knows that they're struggling with an issue, and he's going to specifically address the issue. He's going to take the truth of the gospel and say, here's an area where you're struggling. Let me apply the truth of the gospel to this area. And what this is a reminder of, of for us as the priesthood of believers, we're all in this room as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that we need to be on the ground level doing relationships with people so that we know what they're struggling with, so that we know how to take the gospel and apply it to their lives, just like Paul did. So let's watch Paul do this in verse 12. Paul says this, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now in college, I had a fantastic diet. Uh, my diet basically consisted of a can of SpaghettiOs, extra sharp cheddar cheese, and peanut butter crackers. 
take some saltines, put some, if I was really feeling wild, I'd get the chunky GIF, not the smooth GIF, and man, it was so good. And if I was really feeling wild, I'd bust out a, a box of Kraft macaroni and cheese, but it wasn't the noodles, it was like the shape. So I'd always get like the Scooby-Doo box, because they just taste so much better. I don't know why, but that was my diet in college, and some of you might laugh at that, but here's the deal. A can of SpaghettiOs, 99 cents on sale. I mean, not you could eat for a week for 10 bucks. Like, I'm just like, yes, like a block of cheese, $4, a box of saltines, like six bucks. I mean, I'm talking like, this is the way to save some money on your diet, right? And so, I, that was my diet in college. And then I got married. And I married a personal trainer whose hobby is nutrition. And so what <laughs> I began to, what I began to watch was the way that she ate. And slowly over time, I find, found myself giving up the SpaghettiOs. I mean, as much as I hated it, I found myself beginning to give up the SpaghettiOs. And now, after six and a half years of marriage, I find myself going to a restaurant. We went to, out to, on date night last night and went to a restaurant. I ordered a salad. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be in college. I wasn't rolling with the salad. I was rolling with some big old honk of pork. You know, like that's what I was, give me some meat. You know, that was my attitude. So now, but what I've noticed over time is that you know, she's begun to influence some of the, the, the food choices that I make because she's in my sphere of influence. And it kind of took a little bit of time, but slowly but surely she began to influence me because we spent a lot of time together. Now, the point I'm trying to make with that is that that's true for all of us. The people or the influences you allow to push in on your life, you will slowly begin to see those characteristics spring up in yourselves. And I don't mean that as like a negative aspect. I could also be a positive aspect. If you surround yourself with people who love Jesus and people who are chasing after him, you'll see those attitudes spring up in you as well. But the reason I think this is helpful for us is because that's what was happening with the Corinthians. Because, see, the Corinthians were believing something that wasn't biblically accurate because they were allowing themselves to be influenced by a group of people who didn't believe the Bible. Some of you are like, okay, where do you get that? Well, if you go over to Acts chapter 17, and we're not going to read it, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it for you. Paul rolls into a city, and he rolls into Athens. And he rolls into Athens, and the people in Athens, the Greeks, they had a predominant belief that the spirit was good and the body was bad. The spirit was good and the body was bad. So death was the freeing of the spirit from the body, which was a good thing, because the body was broken, and the body it was something you wanted to get away from. And so the idea, when Paul rolls into Athens and he starts preaching the resurrection of Jesus, saying that he was dead and then he came back to life, the Greeks had a big problem with that. And the problem presented itself because the Greeks were like, why would anyone want to go back into their body? Like, that just, that's not right because the body is broken, the body is bad, the spirit is good. So why would we want to see someone who went back into their body? And that was the predominant belief of the day. That's why the Corinthians... Their city, resting only 50 miles from Athens, would have looked at the idea of the resurrection of the dead, the fact that there will be a day when the dead who have fallen asleep in Christ are reunited with their body. The Corinthians would have looked at that and they would have gone, we don't want to have anything to do with that because they were being influenced by their culture that said the body is bad, the spirit is good. So what was happening was they were bringing this cultural, unbiblical influence into Christianity and basically saying, well, we know what? We don't want to push aside all of Christianity, but we don't like this one little aspect, so we're going to kind of cast that aside. Now, we've got to understand what the Bible teaches, and Paul's going to go into this in great detail. But the Bible teaches that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Paul writes, yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So what this means is that when you pass away, you go home to be with Jesus. But Paul also tells us, and I'm not going to read this, I'll just paraphrase it, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Paul tells us that there's going to be a time where our bodies are reunited with our souls. That's when Jesus comes back to make everything new. That's the teaching of the scripture. And so the people in Corinth would have been like, oh, no, 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 we don't like the idea of like the soul coming back into the body. Because you know our culture says that the body is bad, and so they began to disbelieve portions of scripture, which is what Paul is telling them here. That's what he's addressing. And the reason I want to take a second to show us this is because every one of us, like I said, is influenced by our culture. 
Every one of us is influenced by our friends. Every one of us is influenced by the media we consume. And listen, I am not the anti-movies, television, so I'm not that guy. We just talked about Star Wars. Like, I'm not like, don't ever go to that movie. Rah, rah, rah. You know, it's like, you can't see an R-rated movie, which really messed up Christians when The Passion of the Christ came out, because it was rated R. They're like, uh, what do we do? What do we do? We handle this. So I'm, I'm not that guy at all, but I just simply want you in the Holy Spirit to be aware that you're being influenced. And maybe that means there's certain influences in your life that are unbiblical that you can handle because you're ministering and it's helping you see the world. And maybe there's certain influences you're like, I, I need to get away from that because it's pulling me away from God and from his word. Why is that important? Well, Jesus himself said in John 17, 17, he's praying to God on our behalf. And he says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. He's saying, grow them in your word. Grow them in truth. Your word is what is true. And so we want to be a people that are constantly coming back to God's word and allowing God's word to wash over us and show us what is actually true versus letting the culture, the world, our friends, or our social media feeds dictate for us what is true. And so that's what Paul is addressing here. And he's going to say, hey, this is a false belief that you have that isn't biblical. Let's unpack this for a second and see how, like I said earlier, illogical it is for you to believe this. Which brings us to point number two, no resurrection. No resurrection. So Paul's about to, he's about to get super logical and show them the implications of the false belief that they are trusting. And he's going to say, okay, if you really want to go that way, let's see what that actually means. Paul's appealing to the intellect. No, uh, and so we got a couple of sub points here. Letter A, first thing Paul's going to point out is Christ is still dead. Christ is still dead. If there is no bodily resurrection, then Christ is still dead. Look at this. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 13, he says, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now before we move on, I want to point out something here. The Corinthians were disbelieving in a human resurrection from the grave. And what Paul just reminded us of was that Jesus is human. Jesus is not only 100% God, but he's 100% man. That's why if mankind doesn't raise, then Jesus didn't resurrect, because Jesus was a man. And so I always want to take a second to remind us of this, because it changes our perspective on who God is and what God has done for us when we remember that Jesus was fully human. Jesus was so human that when he started his ministry, get this, when he started his ministry and started teaching some of the stuff he taught, his family, who had known him since birth, went to get him, to bring him home, because they thought he had gone cray-cray. They're like, he has lost his mind. We need to go get him, because he's teaching things like the fact he's God. We need to go get him and bring him home. And that was his family who knew him from birth. It wasn't like his brother James was like, oh, I knew it. I remember when we used to take baths, and Jesus, you couldn't put him in the water because he kept standing up on top of the bath water. I remember that. And no, that's Jesus. It's about time. And he starts telling everybody. He's no, they didn't think that. Nobody thought that. That's how human Jesus was. That's how human Jesus was. I was reading this week. It just came to my attention this week as I was reading John chapter 13, verse 21. It's not going to show up on the screen. But in John 13, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he tells them, he says, my heart is troubled because he's talking about Judas who's about to betray him just a few minutes later. Jesus, he knew Judas was going to betray him. He knew that Judas was going to betray him when he chose Judas, Judas to be a disciple. But nevertheless, he was so human that he was still brokenhearted when one of his best friends, the guy he trusted with his money, Judas was the treasurer, was about to betray him. That's how human he was. That's how human he is. And let me tell you this. You're going to go through stuff, and you need to be reminded of this. Because you're going to go through stuff, and you're going to go, why, God? Why am I dealing with this? And you might not get an answer. But you know what you will be reminded of? The fact that he knows exactly what it feels like to go through what you're going through. And that's such an encouragement for us. Letter B. Not only is Jesus still dead, we're going to see what that means. What it means if there is no resurrection. Preaching is a waste of time. Preaching is a waste of time. Paul says this in verse 14. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Now, I hate wasting time. I hate wasting time. We just moved. And we now have a garage door, which is cool. So we have a garage door, and my wife's car has like one of those built-in like garage door clickers. My dad, 16 years ago, when he bought the car I was driving, the car had it in there, but he had to remove, remove it because he was able to save somebody. So my car doesn't have that, but, but my wife's car 
does. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to be like awesome husband and program the home link thing in my wife's car so that the garage door can come up, not by hitting, hitting the opener, but by hitting the little button in the car. So one night this week, I was like, I'm going to do it. And our garage door opener is so old that it's not like the universal one where you hit the learn button. It's more where you got to like program all the little numbers. So I kept hitting in the numbers on the thing. And after like 15 or 20 minutes, I couldn't do it. And I knew I had been outside too long, meaning that my kids might have like burnt the house down. My wife was trying to get them ready for bed, and I should have been in there helping. But I was like, no, I've already devoted this amount of time. Like, I've got to keep pushing forward. I've got to keep pushing forward. And finally, after like 30 minutes, I was like, oh, I'm fine. And I, something inside of me, like at that moment, just died. Because I just realized, like, I just wasted 30 minutes. It was such a waste of time to try to do that. But here, here's my point. I hate wasting time. I hate doing stuff in vain. I hate doing pointless things. I want to live a life on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose. I want to be intentional about the things that I do. And I'm sure Paul did too. But what Paul is admitting here is this. He's simply saying, if Christ has not been raised, then what we're preaching is just a, simply a waste of time. The way that Paul was living his life would have been characterized as a waste of time. Let me read to you something that Paul writes a little later in 1 Corinthians 15. He writes this in verse 32. Paul says, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with the beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now let me say this. We don't know what the beasts at Ephesus were. We don't, Paul, maybe Paul was just like the guy who just like took on the bull. I don't know what Paul was doing. But apparently, like... Paul was laboring intensely for the gospel. Paul traveled the Mediterranean rim. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by snakes. I mean, he fought all... He, there was once a mob that came after Paul, stoned him, thought he was dead, left. Paul popped back up, went back into town and preached the gospel. That's Paul. Now, when you look at somebody like that, if Jesus really isn't raised, he's just simply wasting his time. Why is he doing all that? Why is, he, why is he willing to give up everything? By the time Paul's life was over, I'm sure his body was a mangled mess. From the amount of times he was beaten, broken. I mean, I'm sure that like, he did not even resemble what he looked like when he originally gave his life to Jesus. Why do that, Paul? Or even on a much smaller scale, why, why should you come to the body church? Like, like, why should you labor in church and labor at your jobs to share the gospel if Jesus really isn't resurrected? It's in vain. It's a waste of time. Our faith is a waste of time. That's what Paul's saying. This is the logical argument. He's, he's saying, look, if Jesus isn't alive, then we're wasting our time. But not only that, let us see, we're liars. We're liars. Because look at verse 15. Paul says this. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. Remember back to verse 8 earlier? where Paul said, I saw Jesus resurrected. If you go over to Acts chapter 1, verse 22, what you see is that when Judas killed himself, after Judas betrayed Jesus, we mentioned that earlier, Judas went and killed himself, and they had to replace Judas on the roster of disciples and apostles. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 22, what you'll see is that a prerequisite to become an apostle was the fact you had to see Jesus resurrected. Why? Because these guys were the eyewitnesses. These guys were the ones who were supposed to say, no, 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 we saw it with our own eyes. This isn't hearsay. This isn't telephone where somebody told somebody, told somebody, told somebody, told somebody, and then it came to me. No, no, they all had to be eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And what Paul's saying here is this. If Jesus really isn't resurrected, they're all lying. They're all lying. They're, they've made the whole thing up. You can't trust Paul. You can't trust anything he wrote. You can't trust the book of John because he was an eyewitness to the resurrection. You can't trust Revelation. You can't trust 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And on and on and on we could go. And all we need to do now is just take the Bible and throw it out the window and go home. That's the implication. Do you see that there's no middle ground here? Because people like to play that game in our culture. They're like, oh, well, maybe it happened and maybe it didn't. If it's true for you, that's fine for you. No, no, no. Either it happened or it didn't. And the implications of either are huge. But then it continues to grow. Letter D, still in sin. Still in sin. Look at verses 16 and 17. Paul said this, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Now, this morning, I brought an envelope up here. Most of you probably can't see it, but it says, 
February 2016. Now, I was going to bring my entire drawer full of these. Like, I've got a giant drawer in my desk that is full of these types of envelopes that have dates on them because these are all of our receipts from 2016. We have envelopes going back to 2011. Some of you are like, why? Because I'm OCD and I started it, so I'm going to continue it. That's how I roll. So I've got this, this um, envelope up here, all the receipts that we, all of them. Like, Colleen's just like, can we just throw those away? No, because there might be a time that you need a receipt because something came up. I don't know. So anyway, we got all these receipts and I pulled out earlier this morning, I pulled out our Costco trip. Now, most of you, I've used this illustration before, but I think it's incredibly helpful for us to understand the implications of the resurrection. Now, most of you, you've been to Costco, right? So when you go to Costco, I, I have this, I, I've, like, I've trained my brain to always put the receipt in my wallet immediately so I don't lose it. And Costco frustrates me because you've got to pull it back out to show them that you actually purchased everything in your bag. And so like they go and they, can't, they look at the little number of items here and then they make this squiggly mark, right? If Avery or Hadley are with us, they make a smiley face. So that's kind of the deal we roll with when we got the kids. But what that means is that they're looking at our cart and they're going, okay, you've got nine items and you've got nine items on receipt, on, on your receipt. This means that you've paid in full, you're allowed to go. That's how Costco operates. That way they know you didn't just throw something in your cart before you left. Some of you are like, okay, what does that have to do with the resurrection? Listen, Jesus resurrected is proof that our sins are paid in full. If Jesus really isn't alive, then we have no idea if our sins are truly forgiven. Some of you are like, why? why? Jesus' resurrection is the receipt. And what I mean by that, if you go over to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, what you see is that the wages of sin is death. Just like the cost of buying milk at Costco is 10 bucks or whatever, it would be it's in packs of three. It's not one thing of for 10 bucks. But, but the, just like that's the cost of buying milk at Costco, the cost of sin is death. How do we know that it's been completely paid for? Jesus came through death and he was allowed to go, just like you're allowed to go when you show your receipt at Costco. His being alive is evidence that the sin debt is paid in full. Some of you are like, where do you get this? Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Paul writes, who, Jesus being, who was delivered up for our trespasses, meaning he died on the cross for our sins, and raised for our justification. Do not forget this because we're coming back to it at the end. Raised for our justification. Meaning that Jesus' resurrection is the proof that in God's sight we're justified. We're made right, we're perfect, we're holy, because Jesus is alive, because the tomb is empty. And if the tomb is not empty, if Jesus is still dead, then we are still in our sins. We are falsely believing that we are forgiven. We are falsely believing that we have received mercy and grace. Do you see the implications of there not being a resurrection? Then we get to letter E, hopelessness for the deceased. Hopelessness for the deceased. Verse 18, Paul writes, Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. And so what Paul says, if you're still in your sins and you're not forgiven, then you didn't go to be with Jesus for eternity. You went to hell for eternity. They falsely believed in something that wasn't true and they have perished. There's no hope for them. And all of a sudden we're reminded of where our hope comes from when we begin to face the prospect of this life ending. It comes from the resurrection. And if there is no resurrection... The best we can hope in is something we find on the back of a Hallmark card. I mean, reality, like, oh, you know, with the angels, and you're at the, you know, floating on a cloud. I mean, this is, that's all the Hallmark stuff. Like, there's no backbone to that. One of the things that's really cool that I've gotten to do as a minister, and I've gotten to do more of it lately, is just spend time with people. I love spending time with people. Now, there are certain people, and this is just a part of me being a pastor, that when you're with them, you're pouring out. You're spending time with them, you're pouring out, you're, you know, helping them through things, you're talking to them, you're praying for them. But then there's certain people that I spend time with that pour into me, oftentimes unexpectedly. Like when I spend time with them, it's a joy to my heart, it's a joy to my soul. Like I leave time with them refreshed. And two of those people are Sam and Suzanne Winston. One of the things that I've got to do is I get to go over to their house every now and then, usually Thursday afternoon, and just talk to them about, like, what's going on and how they're doing. And oftentimes I go over there and I'm like, I want to hang out with Sam and Suzanne. And I leave and I'm just, like, refreshed in the Lord because they love Jesus and it's evident in the way that they talk to each other and the way they lay their sins out there and we pray for each other. It's just so encouraging. And one of the things, I was talking to Sam a couple weeks ago, 
I guess this was two weeks ago, and I was talking to Sam, and he was just talking about the fact that he's working through some health issues right now. And he mentioned casually, he was just like, I know that I'm going to go home to be with Jesus soon. I, I know that, that that's coming. Like, I know that's what's in store for me. And Sam simply said, he said, until I go home, I just pray that Jesus would continue to use me. I just pray that in the meantime, Jesus would continue to use me. And I followed up that conversation this week, knowing that we were preaching about this. And I just talked to him, and I said, like, when you're beginning to, like, come to that realization, like, how does the hope of the resurrection work into that? He's like, oh, it, it's everything. Because you know that on the other side of this is a, is a resurrected body. You know that there's a hope waiting for you. And I just began to think and we began to talk like, what does it look like to begin to face the prospect of this life ending, not having hope in the resurrection? Like, what, is, what does that actually look like? There's a guy, his name is Bob Beckel, and he wrote a book. The title of the book is kind of eye-catching. It's, I Should Be Dead. Kind of like jumps off the page at you, right? I Should Be Dead. He was the campaign manager for Walter Mondale's Democratic campaign against Ronald Reagan. And he had a real rough lifestyle. Real rough lifestyle. But one of the things he talks about in his book is how he gave his life to Jesus. And in kind of prefacing the idea of him giving his life to Jesus, he writes this. He said, baby boomers like me are starting to see the big black wall at the end, and they wonder what happens after that. In many ways, they want to believe, but they just can't bring themselves to believe because society doesn't make it easy. And that's absolutely true. But the thing that jumped off the page when I saw that was simply this. What do you do when you begin to come to the realization that this life is not eternal? Now, I'm a 29-year-old. That's not on my radar. Like, I, I, I'm not thinking about things like that. I go to the doctor once, like, every two years. Like, that's just kind of how I'm, I know I should go more than that. But the deal is, like, that, that's just not on my radar. But then what happens is you begin to age and you begin to think about that. Because, see, the truth is simply this. If there is no resurrection, then where is your hope? If you don't know Jesus, where is your hope? In this life only? Keep eating spinach and keep trying to be healthy. That's great. That's good. All those things are fine. But if you don't know Jesus, like, what's after that? But see, for the Christian who does know Jesus, who knows that Jesus is resurrected, you know that this life is not all that there is. You know that there's something to come. See, one of the things I like to point out to our church is simply this. We love the fairy tales. Now, we get old and we get cynical and we like to pick them apart. But when we're young, I'm watching it in my daughters. They love the fairy tales. We love the ideas of some of the things in the fairy tales, including Peter Pan, right? We love the boy that never grows up. Why? Because we never want to grow up. We never want to age. We want to stay in our 30s forever. That's what we desire. And something inside of us tells us that that's the way it should be. That's the way that life should be. But yet we age and we begin to realize that's not the way it actually is. And the problem is we know that's the way it should be, but yet that's not the way it is. And we keep going to funeral after funeral after doctor's appointment after funeral. And you know what? That should make us a little mad. Like death should make us mad because it doesn't seem the way it is even though that's all we've ever known. And the point I'm simply making is this. Deep down in our hearts, we know that the fairy tales are true. We know that we were built to live forever. And the beauty of the resurrection is that because Jesus is alive, one day we will be too. In a resurrected body, listen, that's impervious to disease. That doesn't get sick. That doesn't die. Like, that's what the Bible is presenting. That's what the resurrection is proof of. Paul's going to say that Jesus is the first fruits of that. Paul's going to say that because Jesus is alive and because he has a resurrected body, so do we. And listen, that might roll up in one ear and out the other if you're healthy and everything's great in your life right now. But listen, there's going to be a day where you need to hear that. There's going to be a day where you need to be reminded of that. There's going to be a day where you need to have the hope of the resurrection. Because if not, we're people who should be pitied because we're hoping in something that's not true. Which brings me to letter F. I pity the fool. No, literally, it's uh, I pity the fool. I, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, Mr. T, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. Paul says this, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. We are fools to be pitied. That's what Paul's saying here, because we're believing a lie. We're believing a lie. We're hoping in a, in a forgiveness of sins that isn't there. We're hoping in an afterlife that isn't there. We're living our lives in a way that says we're believing that there's more to this world than there is. That's why you 
give. That's why you give of your time. That's why you serve. That's why there's times where you could take a gain and you take a loss instead because you know it'll help somebody else out. Because if there is no life after this, man, you should take all that is yours. You should seize the day and do whatever feels right in that moment. You should eat and drink because tomorrow you die. And Paul says we are to be pitied if the resurrection isn't true. And what I hope you're beginning to see is the implications of the resurrection. Back to the opening illustration. You can say you're a Christian but not believe in the resurrection, but don't you see your Christianity crumbling under the pressure of not believing the resurrection? Now, if we just prayed and went home, we'd all be really depressed. Um, but I'm glad that Paul doesn't stop there. Number three, Paul, he's alive. Paul says he's alive. Jesus is alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 22. But in fact, isn't that a beautiful but? That didn't come out right. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. That is, see, what Paul's saying is, this all could be true, but it's not. But, but it's not. That's such good news. Because what that means is that everything we just saw that could would be true if the resurrection wasn't true is not true. That means there is forgiveness of sins. That means there is hope. That means the apostles were telling the truth and they were giving their lives for the most important thing on this planet, which is the forgiveness of sins in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what that means is that there is an afterlife, that there is something to look forward to, that this world isn't all there is. That's such good news. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying this, but since Jesus is alive, none of these things things are true. And all of the things you've hoped in are true. And that is such a beautiful thing. But I don't want to leave it there. I don't want to just leave it in a place where we like aren't applying it to ourselves. Because I can sit up here and spend 37 minutes and 29 seconds convincing you that some other historical event happened. But I want you to see that it matters to you just as much as it mattered to the Corinthians. Say we kind of did a different sermon, and instead of doing a sermon, we had like a panel of people. Because we like stories, right? I love stories. I love hearing people's stories and their testimonies and what God's doing in their life and how God's working in their life and the brokenness that he's working in. I love that. So imagine we got a panel of like 10 people up here, and we just interviewed them and let them tell their stories. And so you're listening to one person, and the person who starts, they're talking about their sexual struggles. One of the things they mentioned is the fact they cheated on their spouse and blew up their marriage and blew up their home. So they cheated on their spouse, they're, they're, and all of the implications that come from that, maybe they've got kids, it's just a nasty scene. And that's the person sitting over here, there's one or two people over in this corner who struggle with that, have that story. And then you keep moving over, and you got this one person, and they, they're struggling, they, they're like a kleptomaniac. They just keep stealing things. Like they, they steal things off the rack at the store, they steal personal property off the computer, like they're just stealing stuff all the time and all the implications, in and out of jail because they can't stop doing that, like that's the life that they were living. And then you've got somebody sitting in the middle talking about greed, talking about how they ran over so many people and ruined so many relationships just to make a buck. And they would do anything they could to make a dollar. And they could anything they, and they were never satisfied with money. And they saw how it ruined them because they could never truly be satisfied. And then over towards this corner, we've got some people who struggle with substance abuse. Somebody who's struggling with alcoholism and all the, the things that come from that and all of the ruin that comes from the, the way of that lifestyle and the things that that does. And so that's that person. And then you've got you know, somebody at the very end who loves to gossip about all the other people on the panel. That's their life. They don't have any true friends because all they do is collect information to slander everybody else. And all of these people are up here and they're telling their stories and all of a sudden they start talking about how they're changed. And something has changed them. So we're like, okay, well, who are those people? Those are the people at the church at Corinth. Those are the people who Paul was writing his letter to. Let me show you this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. This is just nine chapters earlier than verse 15. In the same letter, Paul writes this. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, de be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. All of these people. And then Paul says this in verse 11. He says, But such were some of you. 
teacher. That's who he's writing his letter to. Those are the people that were struggling and in this lifestyle, and they were giving themselves over to all of these things. And then Paul says this at the end of verse 11. He says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. In other words, the change that they would all tell you, it came from Jesus. Now remember with me for a second, I told you to remember this. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. What is it that gives us our justification? Jesus' resurrection. Remember Paul, right then he says, and he was raised for our justification. Look back to what Paul said in verse 11. He says, but you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ. And what Paul just showed us using Romans and using 1 Corinthians is this. The reason that the Corinthians were justified, the reason that they were forgiven, the reason that they were in God's eyes made right, pure, and holy, their justification came from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want us to see is that because it's true, so we are justified. It doesn't matter what your current sin struggle or your future sin struggle or your past sin struggle is. Because Jesus is alive, if you are in Christ, the debt is paid in full. You're forgiven. You're made right. You're holy. You're spotless. You're free of blemish. That's why not only at Easter and the season surrounding it, but every day we as Christians celebrate that Jesus has overcome the world, that death couldn't hold him down, and because death couldn't hold him down, it won't hold us down either. That's why Christians, even though we go through sorrows, even though we go through brokenness, we have a joy that no one can take from us because we know that Jesus took the worst this world had to offer, and he overcame it in the resurrection. So what we're about to do is we're going to worship again. We're just going to worship him. And we're going to thank God that he's alive. And we're going to see that in our lives we're changed when we trust in his resurrection. And I don't know where you stand. Maybe you, you're in this room and you, you know everything that I said. You might have even saw some of this stuff coming. Well, Jason's going to use this justified verse and use that. And all. Maybe you, you're a biblical scholar, but you've never truly trusted in the resurrection. And the invitation to you this morning is the same one I read in the introduction, which comes from Romans chapter 10, verse 9, where Paul writes, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And maybe that's what somebody in this room needs to do this morning, is give their life to Jesus. So I've got to believe this. Like, I see for the first time, the eyes of your heart are opened up, and you're like, okay, I see it. It's like a light bulb just went off. I get why he did it. Jesus didn't come to make me some sort of good person because he's trying to change my behavior, and if I'm good enough, maybe he'd accept me. No, Jesus came to make me a new person. Jesus came to take his resurrection and apply it to my life so that I, too, can be made right in God's sight. And maybe this morning, that's you, and you need to give your life to Jesus. So bow your heads and maybe we'll pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. God, not the words that I said necessarily, but God, the words that your Spirit has given us in your Word. Because as we saw, your Word is truth, and God, I thank you that the truth of your Word reveals to us the beauty of the resurrection. Yes, it absolutely happened. We saw that last week. So much historical evidence that it happened. But God, we don't want to just stop there. We see why it matters. Why it matters that you're resurrected from the grave. God, it gives us hope. It gives us freedom. It gives us forgiveness. It gives us, when, when we look at what we saw, the, the, the black wall at the end of life, we know that that's not the end, God. We know we get to go home to be with you, and we know that one day you're going to give us a resurrected body just like you gave Jesus. Lord, these are hopes that we cling to, not in some sort of suspension of disbelief. We have to come in here and act naive and not use logic and think these things through. No, God, I thank you that your truth makes sense. And when we begin to shine a light on the truth of your word, God, it's the things outside of your word that disagree with your word that look illogical. I thank you for that. And so, Lord, just as a church, as we get into your word, Lord, I pray, or get into worship, Lord, I pray that you would just enlighten our hearts to see these things. I know some of us are tired, we lost an hour of sleep last night, but God, just allow for us to just worship you now. And God, if there's anyone in this room who's never truly given their life to you, they never 
seen the resurrection as their justification. They've always looked to their good behaviors, maybe even the fact they're in church this morning for their justification. God, maybe that's what they're looking towards. Lord, show them that it's not found there. The forgiveness of sins is found in the resurrection. The hope of eternal life is found in the resurrection. Your grace, peace, and mercy is found in the resurrection. And let us be a people who never forget this. Let us be a people who worship you. Let us be a people who celebrate that this morning. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Y'all stay with me and we'll worship.